chapter 9, verses 43 through 48. If you have your Bible, I would like for you to read along with me these verses. Mark chapter 9, verses 43 through 48. If you do not have a Bible, we have some spares uh, under the chairs. In this day of technology, when everybody has a smartphone and a smartphone and iPad and all of that stuff, everybody has their Bible with them all the time, right? But if you happen to be one of those people with a dead battery, we have some spares under the chairs, all right? Mark chapter 9. Spare Bibles, thank you. No, if you happen to be one of the ones with a dead battery, yeah, we got some spares under the chairs. Anyway, verses 43 through 48, Mark chapter 9, let's read together. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than to have two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes be cast into hell fire, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Let's pray. Lord, the passage we just read has some very difficult things in it. And some things, Lord, that it would be difficult for us to understand without, Lord, uh, a good balance of knowledge of your word. For we know that you would not have us to mutilate ourselves by doing these things, but the point you're making by hyperbole is that sometimes it takes a radical action in order to be right with you, and we know that. But then, Lord, that's that other part, Father, about fire and hell that is very sobering to us. And I pray this morning, Lord, as we look at, Lord, this sermon, the reality of hell, that you'll speak to our hearts as believers, you'll give us a deeper burden for the lost, a deeper compassion for those that we know and love. And that, Lord, if there's anyone here this morning that's not saved, Lord, that they'll take heed to the warnings that you give in Scripture, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The passage that we just read, by the way, is not just a New Testament teaching. It's actually a quote, or part of it is a quote from Isaiah 66, verse 24, and I'll just read that to you very quickly so that you'll catch it. But in Isaiah 66, 24, it says, They shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me, for their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. So as you can see, uh, what Jesus was doing was quoting a portion from the Old Testament. And according to Jesus, the passage in the Old Testament is about hell. Nowadays, a lot of people want to explain away all the Greek and all the Hebrew words and try to make it sound like there is no hell. Modern man has gotten too smart for his own good. He no longer believes that what the Bible says is true. Some no longer believe that there is even an afterlife because they've swallowed the lie of evolution and that there is no God and, and everything just kind of goes on, you know. And so they don't believe in a heaven or a hell or a God. Others believe in an afterlife, but they believe, you know, somehow it's going to be peaceful and, and light and oneness with the universe. No judgment, no condemnation, no rewards, no hell, no heaven. Still others believe that hell is some sort of eternal state of mind where we're tormented by the memory of all the bad things that we've ever done in this life. Somehow maybe sitting in our rocking chair on the heavenly shores remembering all the bad things we've ever done. That's very annoying. Make it stop. Thank you. But Jesus said that hell is real and that we should do anything and everything necessary to make sure that we avoid going there. The teaching of hell in many churches today is neglected. It's twisted. 
and avoided doctrine. It's either watered down or sometimes not taught at all. If you're here this morning, you may have never ever heard a sermon on hell. I think I've only preached on the subject twice in 20 some years of preaching, this being the second time. But Jesus said it's real. And we need to avoid going there. And this sermon is designed for two purposes. First of all, to help us believers to understand that, that this is a real place. And people that we know and love that are lost without Jesus Christ, they're going to this real place. We need to be reminded that we have a responsibility, a burden, and a privilege to tell them about Christ. It's also there for non-Christians. If you're here and you're not saved, this is your future. This is what you have to look forward to when you die. Now, you might not even believe that there's anything after death. But you have to choose between the Bible and whatever it is that you believe. And if the Bible is true, and you die without Christ, you're in big trouble, because hell is real. In 1979, a book was published entitled Beyond Death's Door. It was written by um, a doctor. His name was Maurice Rawlings. Rawlings is not a quack. He is not a sensationalist. He was not the average doctor. He was one of the best in his field. His reputation as a doctor was beyond question. So much so that in his career, he was a doctor of President Eisenhower. He was also the doctor of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So this is not just some guy. He was somebody. He has credibility. He was also the assistant clinical professor of medicine in the University of Tennessee. As a specialist in internal medicine and cardiovascular disease, Rawlings had resuscitated a large number of people who had been declared clinically dead. He knew the face of death. He knew what it looked like. But Dr. Rawlings was also an atheist. He believed that all religion was simply superstition and that death was just a state of painless extinction. You die and that's it. That's what he believed. That's what he thought. But something happened in 1977 that brought a dramatic change to his thinking. And that's why he wrote the book. You see, he was resuscitating a man who was clinically dead. And I'll read you a quote from his book, Beyond Death's Door. This is what he wrote. He said, each time this man regained heartbeat and respiration, the patient screamed, I am in hell. He was terrified. And he pleaded with me to help him. I was scared to death. Then I noticed the genuinely alarmed look on his face. He had a terrified look, worse than the expression ever seen in death. This patient had a grotesque grimace, expressing sheer horror. His pupils were dilated. He was perspiring and trembling. He looked as if his hair was on end. Then still another strange thing happened. He said to me, Doctor, don't you understand? I am in hell. Please, don't let me go back to hell. This man was serious. And it finally occurred to me that he was indeed in trouble. He was in a panic like I had never seen before. This is what he recorded in his book. He saw a man who died, and he brought him back, and he died again. Now, the Bible clearly teaches us, and I don't know what you think about that story. It really doesn't matter to me what you think about the story. It does matter to me what you think about the scriptures. Because the scriptures are clear that hell is a very permanent and eternal place. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 41. There's a judgment in Matthew chapter 25 and Jesus says this, Then shall they say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. According to this verse, hell is an everlasting fire. A fire that burns for eternity. Still later in the same chapter in verse 46, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Matthew 25, 46 tells us that hell is a place of everlasting punishment. No hope, no end, punished. Forever. Mark chapter 3, verse 29. 
But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. Eternal damnation comes from a Greek word. The Greek word is krisis, if you care about that kind of thing. And it means accusation, to be accused, condemned, or judged. In hell, you will be condemned, damned forever. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 17. Speaking of the apostates, the false teachers, says these are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. Hell is a place of fire, and yet in some way it's described as a place of darkness, spiritual darkness, maybe even physical. Hell. Stinking of sulfur smoke, hell. Burning unbearable heat. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. Burning flesh. It's worse than any horror movie that you have ever seen. Hell where the light never shines. Hell where the soul never dies. Where there's no water, no mercy, no hope of it ever coming to an end. Hell, where each person that is there knows that they deserve to be there. The place of unrepentant sinners, fornicators, adulterers, effeminate, backbiters, abusers of themselves or mankind, liars, every sinner of every type. Hell, a place that Jesus said was prepared for the devil and his angels. A horrible place of torment. Unbelievable, incredible pain, eternal sorrow and suffering. You say, why would God make a place like that? Why would you ever want to reject Christ and go there after all He's done for you? There will be no joy in hell, no love, no compassion, no rest, nothing but anguish beyond belief. People will be crying out in hell. Earth shattering screams and gnashing of teeth in eternal pain and agony. The word hell, by the way, occurs 54 times in the Bible, 31 times in the Old Testament, 23 times in the New Testament. You can find it 54 times. Those who do not believe that the Bible teaches a literal hell, they have to find a way to rationalize 54 references to hell. Not to mention the other places where Jesus doesn't say hell or the writers don't say hell. Instead, they say eternal fire or eternal damnation or second death. You've got to rationalize all of that away. You'll hear people talk about Hebrew words or Greek words and what they could mean and how we could translate them in other ways. You'll hear them speak about customs and superstitions of the Jews. But there is no way that you can explain away 54 references to hell. You must conclude at some point that hell is a real place. And if hell is a real place, then we need to do everything we can to keep from going there. Back in our text in Matthew, uh, Mark chapter 9, Mark chapter 9, verses 43 through 48, uh, the word hell there is translated from a Greek word. The word is Gehenna. The word Gehenna is a very intense Greek word, not because of the word itself, but because of the reality of what it means. A place of eternal punishment. The word Gehenna is it's actually a, it's a contraction of another word, and the word is hinnom. And hinnom is not a Greek word. Hinnom is, is actually from the Old Testament. You may have read about the Valley of Hinnom. It was never used in the time of Christ. Gehenna was never used in the time of Christ in any other sense other than denoting this place of eternal fire and damnation that you and I think of as hell. And it might surprise you to learn that of the 12 times that Gehenna is used in the New Testament, 11 of those times, it's Jesus speaking. Jesus preached on hell. It's obvious there, when Jesus speaks of Gehenna or hell, he's not mincing his words. He's not beating around the bush. It is a place to be feared. Why does Jesus choose this word? Well, other than the fact that it was the word that everybody used in those days. If you spoke Greek, you used the word Gehenna. Other than that, it also has a history behind it. In 750 B.C., there was an evil king. His name was King Ahaz. King Ahaz was the ruler of Judah. 
and the father of Hezekiah, who was a good guy. But uh, Ahaz built idols in the Valley of Hinnom. And the Valley of Hinnom, by the way, is just southwest of Jerusalem. I mean, it's just right there. You walk out the gates, and there it is, southwest of Jerusalem. It's called the Valley of Hinnom. And he built these, these idols there, and they were doing human sacrifice there. They were offering even their own children to the fire. Somehow Hezekiah escaped all of that. And from what we know of his reign, they weren't doing that. But then Hezekiah had a son, Manasseh. Manasseh was an evil, wicked man. And he built back the idols and the altars that were torn down during Hezekiah's time. And they began again to offer human sacrifice there in the Valley of Hinnom. But then Josiah comes along, who is his grandson. And Josiah turns the heart of the people back to God. Well, really, he turns the nation back to God. The heart of the people didn't change a whole lot. And he tore down all of those altars, and he tore down all of those idols, and he turned the place into a literal garbage dump, a trash dump. That's where they would throw all of their garbage and the bodies of dead animals or the bodies of criminals that nobody wanted to claim and bury. They would be thrown there in the Valley of Hinnom to be destroyed, consumed by the worms and the fire. The fire there never stopped burning. And the worms there never stopped feasting on dead and rotting garbage and carcasses. Now what was it that Jesus said? Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. He was painting a very real picture of a very real place, and giving them a very real illustration of something they could see, something that they knew. Three times in Mark chapter 9, Christ spoke of this, the fire that is not quenched, where the worm dieth not. And the fire is not quenched. What could be more horrible than waking up in the afterlife in a place like this? One moment you're on earth, doing whatever it is you're doing, death claims you, and the next moment, you wake up in hell. Imagine, if I were to take you and I would shove you into a stifling hot oven with coals of fire <coughs> touching all over your body, just for a moment... Imagine the horror that you would feel at that moment. But hell's not going to be just for a moment. Hell is eternal. It's forever. You will never, ever escape that. To burn for a moment is bad enough. How much more horrifying if you knew that there was going to be no end, and no mercy, and no water, and no hope. Each second of agony would make the future seem so much longer. Each second of agony would make what goes before you into eternity seem totally unbearable. And yet, you will never die. You will be there in that state forever. A while back I read a news article about a, an accident between a fuel truck and a bus. And the bus hit the fuel truck and it broke open and the fuel was pouring into the bus and then there was a fire. And the people on the bus could not get out. Seventy three people burned to death with witnesses and bystanders hearing their screams and seeing their agony and not able to help them because of the heat of the flames. And folks, hell is going to be much worse than that. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what you would see or hear if you could somehow look down into this horrible place? Turn to Isaiah 66. Turn back there. We'll be there just for a few moments, and I want to show you some things. In Isaiah chapter 66, look at verses 22 through 24. Isaiah chapter 66, verses 22 through 24. For as the, as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. Let me pause there for a moment. This is talking about a time when there's a new heaven and a new earth. And if you read the Bible and study about the new heaven and new earth, you're going to find out that that is at the very end. That's after everything is all done and time is no more. There's a new heaven and a new earth. That is the eternal state. Way out there in the future somewhere from us. That's the time period that Isaiah is talking about. All the judgments are done. Those that are going to be in heaven are in heaven. Those that are going to be in hell are in hell. And there's time no more. And he's describing this time. 
Now look at verse 23. And it shall come to pass that from one moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. Verse 24. And they shall go forth, and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. For their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched. And I remind you that Jesus used that to tell us that that is talking about hell. And they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. We're going to look in some way and see it. I don't know how. I don't know it's going to, how it's going to happen, but we'll see it. In Psalm 52, verses 5 through 7. Psalm 52, verses 5 through 7. God shall likewise destroy thee forever. God's uh, speaking of the wicked. God will destroy the wicked forever. He shall take thee away and pluck thee out of thy dwelling place and root thee out of the land of the living Selah. In verse 5, God will destroy you forever. This is not just death. This is something that's happening forever. You're taken away. You're plucked out. And you're, you're, you're cast out of the land of the living. Verse 6, the righteous also shall see, they're going to see it, and fear, and shall laugh at him. Lo, this is the man that made not God his strength, but trusted the abundance of his riches, and strengthened himself in the, his wickedness. The Bible seems to indicate that somehow, in some way, we will see them. I don't know for how long. I don't know in what way. I really studied and couldn't figure that all out. But imagine... If you could look into hell and you could hear and see what was going on down there, imagine, what would you hear them say? I think one thing we would hear them say, we would hear people crying out, it's too late. It's too late. It's too late. It's too late. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 1, the Bible says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. You're alive today, but you can't guarantee that tomorrow. Some people say, oh, I wanted to wait. I just, you know, I, I wanted to get saved, but I just wanted to wait. I wanted to have my fun. I wanted to make my riches. I wanted to make my fortunes first. In Luke chapter 12, verses uh, 16 through 20, Jesus tells a parable. Luke chapter 12, verses 16 through 20, Jesus tells a parable. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. He was blessed, man. He's getting all the stuff in his life. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I'm going to pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thy ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Let's enjoy retirement. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night... Thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose, then whose shall those things be which thou hast, which thou hast provided? Oh yeah, you made a lot of money in life, but when you die, you can't take it with you. And who's it going to come to? Now this is a good reminder for us. We do not know how long we have to live for the Lord. Remember what God says in the parable. This night, thy soul shall be required of thee. You don't know how long you have. This man was told this very night... You're going to die. The rich man thought he had lots of time. He was working hard. Had himself a savings plan. Everything was going good. He was prepared for old age. But he should have been prepared for eternity. And he wasn't. If you plan on living for yourself in this life, you need to know that at some point this life will be over. And if you haven't been living for the Lord, you're not going to like what comes next. I'd think twice if I were you. Living for the Lord is a better priority. Living for the Lord better be a priority in your life. Because you just don't know when your time is up. You don't know when it's going to happen. You could be sitting there right now and you're thinking to yourself, well, that's all right, I'm saved. I might as well go ahead and take a nap and wait to the end. Yeah, you are. But what about your friends? What about your family members? This horrible place I'm talking about, that's where they're going, Christian. And they're not going to be able to avoid it. 
Don't go to sleep on me. Don't think twice about listening to this. You need this. You need to hear this. You need to understand that hell is a very real and horrible place. And people are going there. People you know. People that you love. They're going to this place. And how can we do nothing about it? Life is short. It's as if we are nothing more than just a little cloud. If you look at James chapter 4, verse 13 and 14... James chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. Go to now ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go to such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. A little cloud that is blown away by the smallest breeze. That's your life. That's what you are. Have you considered that? Have you considered your life? What have you done to prepare for eternity? Have you sought God's forgiveness? Have you repented of your sins? Have you accepted Christ as your Savior? Psalm 39 and verse 5. Behold, thou hast made my days as an handbreadth, and mine age is as nothing before thee. Verily, every man at his best state is altogether vanity. Vanity meaning empty. At your best state, the best you have, the best you can offer, is nothing. The psalmist understood in comparison to eternity that our life is short. A handbreadth. What's that? Short. A handbreadth. Not much to talk about. The psalmist knew he had nothing that was of any eternal value. Listen, if you don't have Christ, you have nothing of any eternal value. Oh yeah, you could have a great job. You could have riches. You could have a nice family. You could have everything that this world has to offer, but you have nothing. What is your life? It is even a vapor. Every man at his best state is altogether empty, vanity. Some people in hell are going to be saying, I should have been more concerned about that. I should have been more concerned. I thought religion was just a lifestyle. You know, just live a good life and you know, go to church and do good things. It didn't seem to be all that important on Monday through Saturday. It wasn't important to me. I was comfortable enough. Everything was good. In Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 25, Jesus tells us the story. Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 25. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. Wow, here's a guy that has everything life has to offer. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sore. Here's a guy that's got nothing that life can offer. There's a guy that's got everything and a guy that's got nothing. Verse 22. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may tip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. Not in this rocking chair with my memories. Not in this eternal state of sadness. But in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime received thou good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is tormented, tor comforted, and thou art tormented. You see, the rich man was comfortable in this life, but in hell, the Bible says he lifted up his eyes, being in torments in the flames. He begged for just one small drop of water, just one drop, just let him stick his finger in the water and just give me one drop, please. But it was not afforded him. It was not given to him, not even that mercy, not even that one little drop of water. If you die without Christ, it'll be too late for you. 
You can cry out to God. You can pray for mercy, but it'll be too late. He's given you this life and this life only. Accept Jesus Christ now. Today is the day of your salvation. After you die, it's too late. No forgiveness. No more time. Imagine what you would hear. It's too late. It's too late. I think something else we might hear, we might hear people crying out saying, It's true! It's true! Everything they told me about this place is true! I didn't believe it, but it's true! Psalm 14, verse 1 is a very well-known verse to many people. It's a psalm of David. It says, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. There is no God. We hear that all the time today. There is no God. They'll tell you through their philosophies. They'll tell you through their teachings. They'll tell you through all of these different ideas and theories that they have. But folks, let me tell you something. In hell, there are no atheists. Every person in hell believes in God. Trust me. They know. Every man... Every woman, every person that has ever gone to hell knows there is a God. They may have denied Him in this life, but they cannot deny Him in eternity. They will know. Every person in hell will be a true believer. There are no false religions in hell. They're all going to believe in God. In Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8. Revelation 21 verse 8. Verse 8 but the fearful and unbelieving, and the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. It's a lake that burns with fire and brimstone. It's not some concept of sadness in eternity. This is a real, literal, miserable place of fire and and brimstone. And every person, every wicked person who goes to hell will be sorry for their sins forever. They will clearly understand how truly wicked they have been. But it will be too late. There will be no more time for them to repent. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 13 through 15. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel... For Satan himself is transformed as into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed into the ministers of righteousness. Get this last statement. Whose end shall be according to their works. When you die, that's not the end. I know some people say, well, when you die, that's it. And if God doesn't remember you, you know, you're just gone. No, you're not. There's a reward coming for you. A reward for something that you've done right or a reward for something you've done wrong. But it's coming. And God says in His Word that their end shall be according to their works. Every apostate, every false teacher, every deceitful worker, every rebel will receive the just penalty for their sins. Their end is coming. And their end shall be according to their works. As their doctrine led people to hell, they too shall share in the same fate. According to 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1, the Bible says they bring upon themselves swift destruction. There were also false prophets among the people. Even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Hello, when are you going to die? Well, I've got my plan. My plan says never. <laughs> But God's got His too. And you just don't know when. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Proverbs 27, 1, remember that? On the day that these people stand before the judge, they stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. They who rejected Him in this life will have no excuse good enough to explain their rebellion against the truth. They are doomed. Not cheerful, not happy, and you might not even agree with it, but I'm telling you, this is what the Bible says, and you've got to make a choice. You can either believe this book, or you can believe whatever theory you've heard out there in the world from other men. 
But I would much rather I would much rather state my eternity on the book that God gave than on some thoughts that somebody else told me. That's the choice you have to make. But if the Bible is true, what I'm telling you is true. Because I'm just telling you what the Bible says. I'm reading the verse and telling you what it says. It's not that difficult. Imagine what you're going to hear. You'll hear people saying it's too late. You'll hear people saying it's true. It's true. I was wrong. I was wrong. And you'll also hear people say it wasn't enough. I did my best. I worked hard. But it wasn't enough. Look at Matthew chapter 7. Verses 21 through 23. Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils. And in thy name done many wonderful works. And then, I want to stop there for a minute. I want you to get this scene here. This is a judgment. And there are going to be people in this judgment that they're going to walk up to the Lord and they're going to say, Lord, look what we've done. We've done many marvelous works. We cast out devils in your name. We've done this. We've done that. And Okay, where's my reward? And Jesus is going to look at them. And the Bible says, and then he's going to say to them, notice what he says, then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. Well, you say you did all these things, but you didn't know me. Jesus is describing a future time of judgment when men will try to explain why they are worthy of reward, worthy of heaven, only to be condemned to hell. And listen to their defenses. I went to church, Lord. I was a good person, I was religious, but Jesus said, no, you were, you were a worker of iniquity. How many people will offer this, this self-designed uh, offering of, of Cain, if you will, and they're going to approach God, and yet they're going to refuse the offering of the Lord Jesus Christ? No hope for them. God gave His Son. That's no small feat, friend. That is no laughing matter. What have you given there's very few people in this life that would give anything for their firstborn. I wouldn't give anything for my firstborn. As much of a headache as he could be from time to time, I love him to death. Sometimes I want to love him to death. But God gave his son. Your self-prescribed religious offering will not be good enough, no matter whatever it may be. But Lord, doesn't, doesn't my good works outweigh my bad works? My good works, I mean, are over here, my bad works. I'm a good boy. I never hurt anybody. I, I never cheated anyone. I, I was pretty honest, and I worked hard, and I tried to help people. I mean, look at my good works, Lord. There's only one bad thing, my friend. You've rejected Christ as your Savior. Now all those bad works are going to be paid for. The penalty for all of that is hell. How many people are going to do that? The problem is our sins and our works, you know, our sins and our, everything that we do goes on the same side of the scale. We need to understand that. Everything that we did as lost persons were acts of unbelief and that which is not of faith is sin. And that all goes on the same side of the scale. There's no faith involved. There's no hope except Christ. Look at Luke chapter 13, verses 26 through 28. Luke chapter 13, verses 26 through 28. Then shall you begin to say, this is Jesus' teaching. He says, then shall you begin to say, we have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence you are. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves thrust out. Good works aren't going to get it, friend. Religion is not enough. Many people come to church every weekend and they sit and they listen as the saints of God sing praise to the Lord and, and they hear the word of God 
And they do all of these things and they listen about God and His goodness and His grace and they sit in the very presence of the Lord Himself and yet they refuse to accept His forgiveness because they will not repent. They will not admit that they are sinners. Nobody likes to say that they're a sinner. If I walked up to you and I said to you, you are wicked. Oh, how dare he? Immediately that's the way we feel. But the Bible says it. We're wicked. There's none that doeth good. No. Not one. No matter how good you think you are, you're not good enough. You need Christ. Religion will not save you. Religion does not save us. Christ alone. Christ alone. It's too late. It's true. It's true. It wasn't enough. Now here's one more. I wouldn't listen. I wouldn't listen. Go back to Luke chapter 16. We read a portion of this, and I want to finish this now in Luke chapter 16, verses 23 through 31. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeing Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thou good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all of this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, if you can't come to me, okay, I got that. But I'm begging you that thou wouldst send him, send Lazarus, to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. That's something else about hell. Every person in hell doesn't want anybody else to ever have to come here. Shouldn't we feel the same? Verse 29. And Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear him. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they would repent. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, by the way, that was the word of God. If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded though one rose from the dead. If they hear not Moses and the prophets, Jesus said that in the first century. In the first century, Moses and the prophets meant the Old Testament, the only Bible that they had. They didn't have the New Testament, they just had the Old Testament. So when you read that, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, in your mind you, be, you should be thinking, if they won't listen to God's Word. If they won't listen to God's Word, they won't listen even if somebody rises from the dead. I think it's interesting Jesus said that. He rose from the dead. They don't listen to him either. If you're here today and you have heard this message, you know what you need to do. It's not an option. It is something you must do. Let me back up. It is an option. You can choose. You can choose to stay just as you are. You can choose to remain in your lost state. You can choose an eternity in a place where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. You can choose that if you want. Or you can choose salvation through Jesus Christ. It's your choice. I can't make you. Even God can't make you. You have to decide this for yourself. You know what you need to do. You know that you need to get prepared for eternity. You must accept Christ as your Savior. You must accept His payment for your sins. Please listen to me. Christian, this is no joke. Hell is a real place. What would you do? What would you do if I reached under the pulpit and I pulled out a can of gasoline and I ran over here to Sean and I poured it on him and I whipped out a box of matches, what would you do? You would jump on me. 
You would hold me down. You would do everything you could to stop me from burning him. Your family members are going to a burning place. You should do everything you can to stop them. You can't make them choose. But you should do everything you can. Every person you pass, if they're lost, they might as well be marching right into hell as they pass you. I wish every Christian here could grasp the reality of hell. I wish that somehow the ground would open up and, and we could look down and see the horror of hell. Maybe that could stir some of us from our slumber. Jesus said, Awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead. I think he was talking about Baptist churches. And Christ shall give thee life. What are you doing to change the future? of the people that you know and love. Let's all stand.